everybody. Welcome. I'm really um, happy to have everybody here. Uh, when when I speak, I speak um, from two organizations. One is the Native Plant Society of Texas. Uh, the this area is uh, serviced by the Trinity Forks chapter. There is also a chapter in Collin County. So if you're in Collin County, look them up. But we'd be happy to have you in the Trinity Forks chapter. We meet in Denton. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one is the Texas Master Gardener Association, specifically the Denton County Master Gardener, Gardener Association. These associations are sponsored and managed by Texas AgriLife Extension. So they are a part of the A&M system of ag managers throughout the state. Um, and they're, the two organizations are somewhat different, but very much aligned. Uh, Native Plant Society, I'll tell you what to plant, and Master Gardener Society, I'll tell you how to plant it and how to keep it alive. So let's see. Well, there we go. Okay, so here's a little bit of information about our chapter of the Native Plant Society. There's our website, it's listed on your resource list. We do provide plants and grants for pollinator gardens and other native plant initiatives in public spaces. So if you have, say, an HOA that's redoing their entrances and they want to put in native plants, that's something that we might be able to help with. Um, schools, parks, you know, that sort of thing. We, all, we have monthly programs January through October. We have a monthly newsletter, which just went up for this month. Uh, we have our plant sale coming up. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we have classes coming up. We're, we'll be teaching the uh, level one class. So if you're interested in learning about native plant landscaping, we'd love to have you there. Our website has plant lists, of which you have one in your handout, the butterfly gardens. There's also one for shade gardens, water gardens, all different types of gardens with a mixed plant list. They're also listed by plant type. So if you're looking at your landscape and thinking, what am I going to replace all these dead Indian hawthorns with? You can just pull the one for shrubs and there's a whole list of shrubs um, that will meet your needs. So it's a good way to do it. And we have a nursery list, um, which is part of the resource list you receive. I would ask you to make a note, Archie's Garden Land in Fort Worth just joined our program, our NICE program, um, in the last week or so, so it didn't make it into the handout. But it's, uh, uh, we work directly with those nurseries to make sure that they have plenty of native plants and know what they're talking about. Um, our native plant sales, I said it's coming up. It's part of the Keep Flower Mound Beautiful uh, Environmental Fair and Trash Off on September 26th, 25th. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Anyway, it's on a Saturday, so 25th. So come on out to Flower Mound High School and buy some plants. The Master Gardener Association also has year-round education information for you. If you'll look on the right-hand side, our ongoing support our website, our monthly newsletter, um, our help desk. You can call or email your questions. And then we do speaking engagements everywhere. Um, our events for the family have been somewhat um, dicey this year, but we do have three coming up. We have our gardening series in Aubrey. Um, I believe there are three, yeah, there's three speakers left for that. We have the one here in Louisville, and there are however many, let's see, one, two, three left for that. And then we have our garden tour on October the 2nd, which is an excellent opportunity to see a lot of plants, a lot of native plants used in the landscape. There are uh, master gardeners at each location who serve as docents. You can answer your questions about those plants or your plants, soil, uh, drainage issues, you name it, we'll be happy to try to help you solve it. So please come on out for the garden tour. Um, you can buy your tickets at dcmga.com. So let's talk about pollinator gardens. Um, pollinator gardens are fun and educational. There's just stuff going on in them all the time. Um, if you 
are friends with your sprinkler system. They can reduce water use. Uh, the ones that we're going to be talking about today are going to be all native plants. So they need water their first year as they get established. But once they're established, you don't need to water them. Uh, and that's the great thing about native plants. It doesn't work if you don't reset your sprinkler system, though. So just keep that in mind. Um, natives also will give you reduced maintenance. It doesn't eliminate maintenance. There's still some things you have to do to keep things neat and tidy, but it's a whole lot less than getting down on your hands and knees and replanting half your yard every season. Um, you can have blooms from eight to 10 months a year. Uh, sometimes you can stretch it out to all 12, depends on the weather that year. You'll definitely have fewer pests and you'll definitely improve your soil quality over time. Um, that's my favorite part about native plants. So pollinators are a lot more than butterflies. We tend to think of butterflies first because they're so pretty and we love them, and I do. But pollinators, really, bees do more pollinating than butterflies do. We have in this area a lot of honeybees and a lot of native bees. And they're different from each other. We're going to talk about them in a minute. Hummingbirds are great little birds that will come and to some extent help pollinate. And then, of course, we have the butterflies and moths that we all love. Um, that picture in the middle there, the bee on the big white flower, that's, um, I'm pretty sure that's one of my husband's honeybees, if I recognize the brand there. Anyway, okay, so Texas is home to over 800 species and subspecies of native bees. So that is a lot of different kinds of native bees. And you can see from this picture that they range in size from pretty small to very large. So if you have large bees hanging around, it's more than likely one of our native bees. Um, in general, they are solitary bees. They, bees, they, don't, um, they don't go in hives. They don't swarm. Um, and they'll leave you alone if you leave them alone. Uh, but Many of them are ground nesters. You can see here, this bee right here, these are, these are their nests. So we're, we're gonna talk about how we help provide for those that, that live in the ground and cavities in the ground. Um, a lot of them live in cavities in, in decaying trees. So there's just a lot of things to know about bees. They're very interesting. Our honeybees in this area are generally one of three or four species, and most of them are Italian, but that's okay. We are happy to have those immigrants here in our, in our state. Texas is home to over 450 species of butterflies and moths, and we have a lot of them right here in this area. All of these pictures are, um, are from my yard. Um, you see the monarchs over here on the blue mist flower and also on the frostweed, um, the giant swallowtail, and, and then the queens over here. So lots of different butterflies we can see here. Um, just a few minutes ago, my husband called me out on the porch. He was watering the herb garden and found a swallowtail caterpillar on the parsley. So that's definitely the latest in the year we've ever had a caterpillar. I thought that was really interesting. So we need to understand what the bees and the butterflies need if we want them to come to our yards. So we need to see what are their life cycles. Well, they both start with eggs, um, and then butterflies have caterpillars. Bees just go straight to larva and pupa, and then they grow up and become flying adults. Butterflies have a little more going on. You can see over here, these are monarch caterpillars on a milkweed. Um, and you can see that that milkweed, I hope you can tell that there's not just a lot of leaf left on there. So this is something you need to be aware of. If you're gonna plant a lot of milkweed and have the monarch, but the monarch caterpillars, is they are gonna eat that plant down to the nub. And that's okay because in two weeks, it will be right back all leafed out and start blooming and you'll never know that it wasn't always like that. So it's just one of those things. This year was especially challenging because the monarchs came through on time 
and the milkweed was several weeks behind schedule, so it was still way too small for the number of monarch babies that we had. Um, and there were a lot of running around with monarchs in your car trying to find milkweed to put it on, so it was kind of fun. So this is from our yard. We had um, we had 14 monarchs that made it into chrysalis that we found. There may have been a whole lot more. And you can see this one's just about ready to uh, emerge, and this one has just emerged. Poor little guy came out on one of those really heavy, damp days, and then he sat on the fence for quite a while trying to dry his wings out. But it was very fun to watch. So. As I said, we need to understand their habitats. Native bees, a lot of them do build their houses underground, and so they need some bare soil. So there are some places in the gardens where we need to leave the soil bare so they can get to it. Bees and butterflies both seek shelter under leaf litter, so we need to leave some leaf litter. Not a ton, but some here and there, and leave it for sure through April or so, until we're through most of the rains and the colder weather. Um, if you have bunch grass, the bees and butterflies love to get down in the center of that. So if you see a bunch grass and it's you know kind of cut, they'll get down in there among the, among the um, stems and stuff. And this is one that's really, um, it's really a cool thing, I think, but Quite a few of our native bees actually chew into the hollow stems. So if you have a salvia in your yard and you know it, it dies or appears to die, it dies above ground uh, in the fall, the native bees will come and chew into those hollow stems and crawl in and lay their eggs. And the eggs will live there over the winter. If you go cut those stems down and sit and put them in the trash or put them in a compost pile, the eggs are likely to have a hard time surviving. So we ask that you leave those stems in place. If it's really bugging you, you can go, you know, pull all the leaves off so it just looks like a sculpture out there. Um, if it's really bothering you, then you can cut them, but lay them down. Very, move them very gently and just put them back in a corner of your yard somewhere. It's winter. Nobody expects your yard to look that great anyway. But they need until late April or early May for them to come out. So that's pretty far along into spring. Dead and decaying lawns will provide shelters for the butterflies and nesting sites for carpenter bees. So many of us have, you know, you have. You have your trees trimmed and they cut off some pretty good sized branches. We'll keep some pieces of that and put them in your garden. You can make them look sculptural and pretty out there. Um, they need some peace and quiet, so please, most sparingly, if at all. And they really need some water. And I know this is a little bit tricky, but these little puddlers are really great. It's just a flower. A uh, flower pot saucer with sand in it, um, not beach sand or playhouse sand, but industrial sand like cement sand, coarse coarse sand. Um, and then you can put some little rocks in it. And you know, this is a great project for kids to make these. You just want to keep enough water in there for it to be moist so that the butterflies will come and sit on the edge, they'll sit on the rocks, and they'll um, stick their little proboscis down in the sand and get the water out. So it's not enough water for mosquitoes to breed, it's just enough to um, nourish the butterflies because they really need that water. And then pesticides, of course, we all know that we need to use those responsibly, read the labels, be very cautious about it, don't spray them on flowers where bees and butterflies are going to be landing and spray more at dusk than in the morning. In the morning is when most of them are going to be out feeding, so if you're going to use a pesticide, please do it at night. And last but not least, they've got to have food. So plants, plants, plants. I bet that's why most of you came to this little talk. So let's talk about plants. Now, 
we need plants for the baby, so for caterpillars and stuff, for their nutrition. And we need plants for the adults for spring, summer, and fall. And the adults are all, they're nectar eaters. So they need something that's going to actually be blooming in spring, summer, and fall, which are not the same plant all the time. Uh, and they need shelter year round. So even plants that we're not going to talk about necessarily, at least they'll provide some shelter. Think about these heavy rains and some poor little butterfly trying to find a big leaf to hide under um, in the course of the rain. Now, uh, look at that. I used the same milkweed picture. Well, anyway, there's the milkweeds up here. Um, this is a, a swallowtail on probably some dill. And then here we have just an assortment of butterflies and, and moths, and there's a nice little bee. So lots of different, um, when you really sit down and look at it, there's lots of different creatures that you'll get to see and, and see in your garden. So keep in mind that native Texas pollinators prefer native Texas plants. And so do lazy, cheap gardeners. And that's where I come in. I am a lazy, cheap gardener. I want to plant something, have it do well, and I never have to replace it. I'm happy to go cut it back, but I don't want to have to dig it up and replace it. So lazy, cheap gardeners are going to love native Texas plants. Our plants are acclimated to our soil and our climate conditions, the weird highs and lows that we get and the temperature swings. You know, in the big freeze in February, um, I know a lot of people lost a lot of plants and I was really sorry. I lost not one single native plant in our yard. Now, some of them moved, you know, the original plant died, but the roots set up another plant, you know, maybe a foot away or whatever, but they all came back somewhere. Um, but those high and low temperatures, and especially our temperature swings are really hard on non-native plants. Our Precipitation, the amount of moisture that we get and the timing, we get all of our rain in, in one month in the spring and one month in the fall normally, um, and not just a little bit all the time. So that's hard on them. And our wind can really be drying and difficult. They will give us reduced water use, as we said, if you adjust your sprinkler system. And they will improve soil quality. And let's talk about how that happens. And I apologize if you've seen this, but you just can't see it enough. These are root plants, the roots of, this, of the plants that grow in this area. So way over here, you get, this is St. Augustine in Bermuda. Those roots are maybe five or six inches deep in the soil. But look at these down here. This one, yeah, that's 14 feet. Those roots are 14 feet, 10 feet, 6, 8 feet. You can see these have got huge root systems. The reason that is so wonderful is that as those roots go down through the soil, they're breaking up the clay, they're, they're forming new little freeways, little pathways for nutrients and rainwater to soak into the soil so that we don't have as much runoff so that the water is deeper in the soil and when we have dry periods the plants have these long roots and so they can bring that water back up out of the soil and take care of their top side so to speak. So what does this mean for us? Well, this is an elderberry that my husband planted. It's outside our fence. It's in a non-irrigated area. It was a beautiful plant in May of 2018, and then the summer hit, and it was hot as all get out and dry, and I was refused to go out there and water because it's too hot. But by September, it was already getting better. Now, here it was in May. Here it is the very next year. So you can see that losing all its leaves did not hurt it one bit. Here it is this year, 528, made it through that deep freeze, didn't even blink. And right now it's putting out berries like crazy, and we're going to have elderberry syrup for our ice cream. So 
this is what good roots will do for you. So we're going to start looking at some plants. We all come to these so we can see the pretty plant pictures, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, but we're only, I'm only just going to hit on a few that you may be less um, familiar with. So this is where you get your plant list out and get ready. Um, we're going to start with ornamental trees because we have a real need for ornamental trees in this area. We are all pretty good about having shade trees. Everybody wants shade trees. And we're not too bad about having shrubs and smaller plants in our yards, but we often overlook ornamental trees. These are the smaller trees, 10 to 20 foot, that are gonna live underneath, pardon me, underneath your canopy, underneath your shade trees, or more importantly, will live underneath your power lines and will not affect the power lines and will not get trimmed by Encore. Um, so these are the trees that we really are encouraging people to go and put in. If you have a small yard, this is the tree you need. You don't need a giant oak tree. You need one of these. Um, these are also the trees that are at the level that many of our birds nest. And because we have a shortage of them across our area, uh, that's kind of a problem right now. So we're really encouraging everybody to plant, plant some of these. The other good thing about it is some of these can either be a shrub or a tree, so you can kind of pick. So let's start with Mexican plum, because that's about the first thing that's going to bloom every year. I want to point out, I've labeled a few of these pictures that I took this year, so you know what, how they looked after the freeze. There it is after the freeze. That's less than a month after the freeze, all blooming and happy, just like it was whenever I took that picture. Um, these are a small tree. They're beautiful. They bloom, as I said, early. Um, and they do make small little plums, which the birds love. But when you go close to this tree, when it's blooming, you will hear the buzz of all the bees because it's one of the few things that's blooming that early. So they are on that tree and they are loving it and they are pollinating like crazy over there. It does usually bloom earlier than most butterflies have emerged though. Mexican buckeye. This is a very cool tree. It blooms um, also fairly early. You can see the beautiful pink blooms on it. Um, I can't figure out how to get the trash can out of this picture, but this is a great little tree. Um, it's it's not a it's a multi trunk tree, um, so it really looks more like a huge bush. And then those of you from Ohio may be happy to see that we do have buckeyes here. Um, this is the seed pod that shows up in the fall. These are two um, trees that we have in, in our landscape. This is our rough leaf dogwood. It's a beautiful tree. It, this one's now filled out more. I should take a new picture, but if you're from East Texas, it, it, this is not the dogwoods that you see in East Texas, okay? This, this is a multi-bloom um, multi uh, little, little plant. Um, it can be a shrub or it can be a tree. We have two. We have this one that has a single trunk and that is clearly going to be a tree. It's just about reached its full height when it's up here. Um, we have another one that is multi-trunk that is a shrub. And so it's just, it's gorgeous. The leaves are great. It, it's a very happy, happy tree. And it's something you don't expect to see. If you, I do want to maybe go back for a second to the Mexican plum. When you look out like off a bridge or whatever in the early spring, and you see a bunch of white stuff out there, you know, growing in the wild areas, and you think, oh, the dogwoods are blooming. No, those are the Mexican plums, so just be aware. This is flame leaf sumac. It's a gorgeous tree. It's especially pretty in the spring when it has all these blooms on it, which will attract all the pollinators. 
Uh, they love it. They will just come and be all over it. And then in the fall, you have these gorgeous bright red leaves and also berries. So you get birds for the berries, butterflies with the um, blooms and, and flame colored leaves in the fall. Blake, I can't read the chat. So if there's a question, just interrupt me. Yeah, we do have one. Okay. Um, how hard is it to keep rough leaf dogwood from expanding its territory in an urban landscape? I know in the wild they tend to form thickets and expand quite a bit. Yeah, we haven't really had that problem, and you'd think we would because our soil is has been much amended and is is fairly loose. It's not really hard packed clay. Uh, where we have them planted because we have them in prepared beds. Uh, but we do we do go around every spring and patrol for that kind of thing and dig up any spares and pot them up for the native plant sale. <laughs> so it's not a big deal for us. I don't think we've ever gotten more than one or two in a year. And you can just dig them up with a sharpshooter and move on. Uh, another question. Does flame leaf sumac spread aggressively? No. At least that's not been our experience. Um, all these little plants underneath it, that's one that's one of our milkweed beds. And they have not they have not disturbed the milkweed. Now we do have them come up out here in this lawn area or over here, you know, in the bed that they're small, and that's why we have a sharpshooter. As I said, we just walk around in the spring and take out any little spares that that are there and pot them up for the sales, or you know, give them away or plant plant them in another part of our property. We have the same plant in many areas. I wouldn't say that any of these are really aggressive spreaders. I'll, I'll tell you if we get to an aggressive spreader. I, I know what you're worried about because we do have some like that, and we'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, Eve's necklace. This is such a fun plant. Um, it, it can grow to be over 20 feet, but normally it does not. You can see this beautiful pink and white flower here. It's like a wisteria, only it's pink. Um, and then in, in the summer, it, becomes, it makes these seed pods that look like black pearls. That's why it's called Eve's Necklace. Um, very cool tree. The, the bees and the butterflies love these, um, love this bloom, and they will come to it. Now this is kidney wood. Kidney wood's a little bit harder to find, but if you go to the nurseries that are in your resource list, most of them will have some. The good thing about kidney wood, well, there's a lot of good things about it, but it's very late coming out. It's one of the last things to come out. And so it's blooming when a lot of the other plants have kind of passed their high bloom period. So you can see here this bee is on this one. Um, this one is right in front of that elderberry. So here's the elderberry we looked at earlier. Remember good roots run deep. Um, when it is through blooming and it loses, if it loses its leaves, this kidney wood just hides it. You just don't notice it. Saying that the elderberry looks big and beautiful when the kidney wood is just sticks coming out of the ground. Um, and so they kind of, they complement each other. The kidney wood, it's really fun. It does have kind of a odd fragrance. It's kind of creosote smelling, I think. I don't know. I, I wouldn't plant it right next to my front door um, or my mailbox or something, but out on the perimeter or even up next to the house, but not right next to a door. Um, it's a, just a great tree or a large bush. It's kind of hard to decide sometimes. 
Now let's talk about shrubs. A lot of people lost a lot of shrubs this year. Indian hawthorns were just massively um, killed. And um, I want to give you some really good options for that. This is our coral berry. This was in May. Um, you can see that this is a beautiful little shrub. It has real small leaves. It's like a maidenhair fern leaf. Um, it only, this is a six foot fence, and that's as tall as that coral berry is ever gonna get. So it only gets to be about four or five feet tall. It spreads a little bit, but not aggressively. It does make little bitty white blooms. Here's what the berries look like. So, and, and they're, you know, later on in the year, but everywhere this berry, I mean, obviously it came from a bloom. So they're like really tucked up under there and the uh, pollinators really like that because they are tucked up under there and so they're protected while they're feeding. Um, it's just a great, great shrub. It will give you um, texture that you won't get any other way in your garden. Now this picture was taken, as I said, May of this year after the freeze. This is the coral honeysuckle which we're going to talk about in a minute. In fact, it, well, anyway, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But here's the little berries, and yeah, the birds and whatnot will come and get those berries uh, in the winter. So here's a list. There's quite a few um, shrubs. Now, the list that I'm showing you here is not the entire list that's on the list that I gave you in the handout. That's why I want you to have the handout because there's a lot more options. I just picked some of the ones that I thought you may not be quite as familiar with um, and you might be interested in learning more about. I'm not gonna talk about Turk's Cap because most of y'all probably know Turk's Cap and love it like I do. Buttonbush. I nominated Buttonbush to be the uh, mascot for 2020 because it looks like a coronavirus <laughs> cell. Um, you just got to laugh if you can't cry. So anyway, so this is a really cool bush. We tried one last year for that, you know, cool bush for 2020, but it didn't make it. So we're going to try it again. Um, it makes a whole lot of these really cool looking blooms. And as you can see, the butterflies are really all over it. So it's a pretty cool thing. I'm also going to recommend pale yucca, and you need to write that in on your list. Let me move back up. If it's in orange on the slide, then it's not on your list. So red yucca and pale yucca. I put red yucca on here because when I was making this presentation, I took a break and went outside, and there were two hummingbirds on the red yucca. So I said, well, we have to, we have to encourage people to put in lots of red yucca. Um, it's a it's a very nice plant and it's great to put under a window because when you look out the window you're just going to see these long tall beautiful flowers and seed pods and you can still see beyond it into your landscape. The pale yucca um, is is also it, it's great for hummingbirds and all our pollinators but there's especially a particular moth that this is its only um, home and you want to make sure and, and we want to make sure and feed that moth. It's a little bit different. It's also would be good under a window because you see you've got this great foliage down here and then you have your bloom stalk coming up um, to be by the window. There's that elderberry again. You just, I love this elderberry. I guess you can tell. Um, you can see the flowers on it. It's flowering in the spring when the monarchs are just coming out and they're hungry, but they need to stock up before they keep heading up to Canada. Um, so you'll have monarchs all over it. You will have bees. These are, again, I'm pretty sure these are my husband's bees, but they live on the other side of the fence. And then here's those berries, man. Great. I mean, look at that bush and then think how many berries that's going to be. It's really fun. 
Salvia grevia. This is the darling of tech knot because once they put it in, they really don't have to do anything to it. They often go back and cut it way back or cut it in little squares. And you see these weird looking little squares sitting in all their beds, but that's okay because in the spring, they're just gonna jump right out and be beautiful little shrubs again. This is one that you control entirely what size it's gonna be. If you cut it back every year, it's gonna stay fairly short like these down here are, like this is. If you don't, it will get to be huge. Like this one is about three and a half or four feet tall. So once I let it get that far out of hand, I had to do a lot of cutting back for a couple of years to get it back down. Um, but these, you just let them bloom. You cut them back. They'll have a big bloom in the spring. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll have a big bloom in the spring. And then they'll have kind of a dormant period in usually in August sometime. Now this year mine are still blooming like crazy, but you can go, you can you cut them back about six inches when they go dormant like that, and then they'll bloom again in September, October. So really a great plant comes in every color under the rainbow now, and pollinators love them all. <coughs> this is a rock. Yes. All right, we have a question about the salvia. Okay. Uh, will salvia bloom as much if it is not trimmed? It will for its first bloom in the spring, and it will bloom again in the fall. It just may not be quite as quite as many blooms. So most plants, when you cut them back, that encourages them to put out new growth and to bloom more. So that salvia just happens to be one that's really affected by that. It'll still bloom again. And in fact, if you just leave it alone, it'll bloom from whenever it starts. Different colors for some reason start different times of the year, but most of them start about May and they'll bloom through October if you don't do anything. You'll just get more blooms if you cut, cut it back a little bit in August. So this one up here is the rock rose, that's Pavonia. It's a member of the hibiscus family, as you can see here. Um, these little blooms are about the size of, a little bit bigger than a silver dollar. Really cute little plant, um, and really one that the pollinators will flock to. So I included flame acanthus because it's very common now in the nursery trade. It used to be very hard to find, but not so much anymore absolutely gorgeous doesn't start blooming until july and so it's going to be feeding your pollinators from july until the freeze and that's you know we want to have that succession of blooms across through the year um lantana is also gonna it's you know one of the later bloomers it will start blooming in late june and july and then it'll bloom through until the freeze so both of these are really good plants now, I want to warn you about lantana because it has been hybridized almost out of existence. If you do, if you, you know, I love those beautiful little yellow and lavender lantana. They are not native and our uh, bees and butterflies may not be able to see them. I've never seen bees and butterflies on them. Um, so you need to look and get these orange ones, the orange and yellow or the red and yellow, those are the native lantanas. Uh, and that's why your plant list has the Latin name on it or the botanical name, They're not always Latin, but anyway, the botanical name so that you can compare that to the tag that's on the plant in the nursery. We're gonna talk about milkweeds because if you're interested in pollinators, you're gonna be interested in milkweed. These are the milkweeds, the list over here are the milkweeds that will do well in this area. Please note, there is nothing on here that says tropical. Tropical milkweed does not do well here. The butterflies are not ready for it when it's here. Don't plant it, just plant one of these instead and all of these are beautiful. The antelope horns you can see up here, the plain ones and the green ones, 
Um, they're just, they look like they're from outer space, but they're so cool. And they both make seed pods that look something like this. And when they open up, you'll just see little puffs of stuff going everywhere. And hopefully some of those will, you know, take root. This is the butterfly milkweed, the uh, Asclepius tuberosa, which is the most common. Uh, it's sold freely in most nurseries mainly because it blooms this beautiful orange and it's so pretty. And this is the one that this year uh, came up early enough to cat to feed our, all of our caterpillars. So you can see, I'm not sure if y'all can see in here all these little bitty caterpillars, but here they are when they have eaten. This is what the plant looked like when the caterpillars hatched. This is what it looked like four or five days later and this is what it looked like maybe three or four weeks later and there's our fence with these are all monarch chrysalis going down the fence i don't know why they all decided to go to the fence but i'm very happy that they did i, I know they need somewhere where they feel protected and they they like to get up high so i guess that new fence paid its way this year. These are the other, some of the other um, milkweeds that are a little bit harder to find. I know Painted Flower Farm has them. Uh, some of the others will have them. So, you know, this will give you some idea of what they're going to look like uh, when they grow up, but all of these will feed the monarchs. You know, was the monarchs are flying from Mexico to Canada for the spring migration um, this area is their first stop so this is where they do their first set of breeding um, and so it's really important for us to have those milkweeds out for them now i do want to ask you to when you buy milkweed you should be getting it in something that looks like that um, looks like this i don't i hope you can see it um, it's a very long skinny pot it's often referred to as a tree pot because they were originally used for trees because they had that long taproot. Son of a gun, so do milkweeds have a long taproot. So you should be seeing it in a pot that's shaped something like that. Okay, I gave you a handout called Growing Herbs for Pollinators, and these are the pollinators that are in it. I do want to encourage you. Rosemary, I mean, none of these are native. Okay, I, that's true. But they're all great herbs. They're good for cooking and they're great for pollinators. Uh, rosemary is especially wonderful because it can be a shrub if you let it. It's evergreen. It will, it will survive here for 30, 40 years. It'll just live forever. It will keep getting bigger if you don't cut it back. But it blooms in the winter. So we need stuff that blooms in the winter because some bees do venture out on uh, warmer winter days uh, in search of nutrition. Um, I would encourage you with these over here, dill, parsley, thyme, and basil, uh, plant several of them in different parts of your garden so that when the caterpillars eat one, uh, you have another one to fall back on because uh, that will happen. Grasses. Grasses can really bring something to your landscape that nothing else can. And pollinators really, um, they like the shelter of the grasses. Uh, side oats grama, I want you to see this. Look at how delicate that is. Just coming out the side. This is our official state grass. So we have the blue bonnets, our official, official state flower. And we have side oats grama is our official state grass. So plant some of those. and. I have a salute to our state. Inland sea oats are a really fun little plant. As they um, grow, the, the seeds turn brown and kind of dry out. And when the wind blows through them, it's just like a little wind chime. But again, these are grasses that the pollinators will hide in and um, seek shelter. Ground covers, always a challenge. I will note that Asian jasmine is not a native ground cover. You can tell because it says Asia right in the name of it. But frog fruit is, 
Um, this is a really cute little ground cover. It does like sun. Our frog fruit survived the, the freeze. These pictures, I believe, were taken this year also. Golden groundsel. Here's our golden groundsel in March. This was about a month after the freeze. It was not only up and happy, it was blooming like crazy. You can see it here. This is a great little plant. The, the leaves on it are cool, and then it just pops up and blooms. And then the stems die off, and you just have leaves just, you know, it's a ground cover. Um, these are wood violets. These are also, I just, I know I say everything's very cool, but it just is. These plants are great. Uh, these are ours in March, about a month after the freeze. They had come up. Now these are right next to the edge because these are very low growing plants. So if you get a border plant, this is perfect for that. You know, along the sidewalk or whatever, they're not ever going to grow out over it. You don't have to come trim them or anything. You just put them in and let them go and they'll spread, you know, to whatever you let them spread to, but uh, they're not real aggressive and they're really cute and they bloom early. So that does give the um, early bees something to, some a nectar source. And then we have our vines. Now there's that coral honeysuckle that I showed you earlier. I want you to think about this plant because it is a hummingbird magnet. Um, they just love it, the way the flowers are shaped, that they, they can really get to it. If you lost shrubs, you might think about building a really low trellis and training a coral honeysuckle to grow along that trellis so it looks like it's a shrub, but it's really this big vine. And you can do that with any of these. These three vines were not included on your list, but they're all um, happy vines for um, pollinators also. So here's the passion flower vine. It's right outside my window. There's, there's actually two bees in this one flower, if you can see it. Um, these are very cool. This is one that um, it died to the ground in the freeze, but it came back in five other places because the rootstock was really well set and it just really wanted to live. So now I have five instead of one. Thank you, freeze. Um, here's a snapdragon vine. These are really fun little plants. I do want to tell you that that bloom right there is about a half inch. I mean, they are small. So plant them somewhere where you're going to be walking close to them, like along the edge of the sidewalk or next to a door. Um, they are, they die to the ground in the winter and then they grow up to be big in the summer and they will reach out and grab onto whatever's close to them. So keep that in mind. Uh, they're not hard to get loose and move. That's a mountain laurel behind it. I just have to keep pulling them out, but uh, just keep that in mind where you're putting them in. Now the flowering plants, how fun, cowpin daisies, this is a good fall nectar source and we really want to encourage that because there's so many things blooming in the spring and fewer in the fall. Cowpin daisies grow in disturbed soil, that's why they're called cowpin. And drumming flocks, of course, we love our flocks, they're so pretty. Oh, there is a mistake on your plant list. I believe that this one has an E at the end. On your plant list, it's actually a bunny. I don't think that's going to kill you because there's not many other plants called partridge pea. But this is a cute little plant. If you've got a wet space in your yard, this is a good plant for it. Um, it's a larval host. It's just it's a good plant. Texas thistle. It's really a great plant, but it's something you're going to want to put like out close to your fence, not up where you're going to be in it very much. Um, and then Drummond skull cap is really pretty. It's a short plant, so it's good for borders, um, the front of your bed. It's just a really good plant, and it blooms for a fairly long time. Look at all the perennials, and this is only the beginning. So blue mist flower, this is one I will tell you is an aggressive spreader. Okay, it is a very aggressive spreader, but it is so worth it. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
you can see there's a bee on, on here. I think this picture has got about four or five bees in it. Um, this blue mist flower blooms from late September through November. Greg's mist flower blooms. Ours is blooming right now. I don't know why it's been blooming for a month, but it will bloom through September. So if you have some of Greg's and some just blue, you'll have mist flower right through the whole fall season. As I said, the monarchs are flying south in the fall. Now, in the spring, when they're going north, there's five generations. So one monarch only flies one fifth of the way. But coming back, it is one generation. So that one poor butterfly has got to get from Canada to Mexico. And he needs lots and lots of nectar. So we want to have lots of nectar available. So we plant blue mist flower, Greg's mist flower, gay feather, all this purple stuff. Um, fall asters, these are a wonderful plant and they will spread as much as you let them, but they're very easy to keep under control too. You do want to cut them back. Um, when they get to be about eight inches tall, cut them back about two or three inches and then cut them back about that much every three weeks until the 1st of July and then stop. And that way you'll have a whole lot more blooms. If you just let them go, they'll be three feet tall and have four blooms on the end and you'll be so unhappy. If you keep cutting them back, you'll have a nice little plant like that with a ton of blooms. So very worth it. Doesn't take but a minute. One time you can use your garden shears. Maximilian sunflower, very, very cool plant. Does grow to be about 10 feet tall, but it blooms like crazy. So plant it along your fence and enjoy it. Frostweed. Not very common, but will be at the Native Plant Society sales, I know, and I also know that many of the nice nurseries have it. It blooms in the fall, so it's a nectar source for our butterflies, for the monarchs. And then in the winter, it's so cool. The first time there's a hard freeze, the stems split open, and the water that comes out forms these ice crystals these little eye sculptures all around the base. So fun, very educational. If you have kids, it's just a blast. Spring and summer, mealy blue sage, also called Henry Dilberg. Um, great plant, really, I consider it to be a shrub because it does get to be almost two feet tall and it will get about that big around. Um, very cool though, and it blooms all summer long. You, you don't have, you can cut it back. You don't have to, it just blooms all summer. Wine cups are, are only going to bloom for about three weeks, but especially if you have a pool, they're great to just let them kind of trail off into the pool. Blackfoot daisies. Everybody's killed a blackfoot daisy or five or 500. Um, I killed probably 500 before I finally read about them and found out that they like dry ground. They don't like to have their feet wet. Moved them outside of the fence. They don't get any water. They don't get anything. And gosh, they're just happy as they can be. They're also about a three or four year plant. So for me, I have four areas where I have them planted and every year I plan to replace one of those. So I don't have to do them all at once but they're worth it. Mexican hat, cool looking plant. Pollinators love it. Can't understand why, but they do. Purple cone flowers, we all love those. That's another one that you can get another bloom on in the fall if you cut them back after they finish blooming um, in the spring and summer. And then the verbena, and I put query verbena on here because it's another plant that has been very nearly hybridized out of existence. The native only comes in purple. Those beautiful, deep, velvet, red looking ones are not native. Um, I'm not sure if the pollinators will find them or not, but I know that they'll find these. And these are perennial, so they'll keep coming back and you won't have to replace them. I really want to talk about Zexmania because it just hit the landscape market about three years ago. It's It's been a native 
a popular plant with native plant gardeners for many years, but it finally hit the market. This is what it looks like in May, okay? May, early May. This is late May, so you can see it's getting better. And there it is in the fall. It is a fantastic plant for pollinators. Look at that fall, all those blooms. Now, if you're wondering if it made it through the freeze, this, this is that exact same plant with this June. So it's already doing serious blooming from after the freeze, you know, and getting ready. So I highly recommend Zetsmenia. Look for it in the garden centers. You will definitely find it at the uh, ones on your list. I'm only going to hit a couple of shade trees because pretty much most people, their shade trees are kind of established. There's not much you can do about it. But I really want to encourage you with the Mexican white oak. This is a great tree. Here it is in 2019. Here it is in 2021. You can see it's a fairly fast grower for an oak tree. Um, it is less susceptible to hypoxylic canker or to oak wilt uh, than most of the other oaks. And it has these really cool blooms that do draw the pollinators very much. They like it. All the oak trees grow, draw a lot of insects. They, we have 580 different insects that depend on various oak trees um, for their lives. So plant an oak if you don't have one. 